This is a big honour for me. I would like to introduce you to Frank Stephenson. Frank has, has got a pretty interesting background. Uh, Frank was born and raised in Casablanca, an American father and Spanish mother. At the age of 11, his family moved to Istanbul, followed by two years in Madrid, where he graduated from high school. After high school, he spent six years competing professionally in motocross. His passion for drawing and automobiles led him to study automotive design at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Frank has been the director of uh, design for Mini, Ferrari, Maserati, Fiat, Lancia, Alfa Romeo, and McLaren, before moving on to Lilium Aviation to lead the design team, creating flying taxis known as EV2L aircraft, as well as being design master at Sunning Intelligent Technology, a major Chinese technology company. List of cars he's had a hand in design include the Ford Escort RS Cosworth, BMW Mini and X5, the Maserati MC12, plus the Grand Sport, Quadraporte and Gran Turismo, the Ferrari F430 plus the FXX and the 612 Scaglietti, the new Fiat 500, every McLaren between 2008 and 2017, including the iconic P1. Additionally, he is the design director of his independent design studio, Frank Stephenson Design, an award-winning team which designs and collaborates with companies worldwide seeking success through creative innovation. A film documentary about his working career entitled Chasing Perfect was released globally. Motor Trend magazine has called him one of the most influential automotive designers of our time. But more importantly, Ant Anstead, master mechanic on Wheeler Dealers, one of my favorite TV programs, referred to him simply as automotive royalty. It's my great honor and pleasure to welcome Frank Stephenson to ISPIM. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm not sure, sure whether I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, I'm glad uh, a lot of people are getting to uh, stay up or get up early or just watch this during their, their daytime. Um, so a lot of good talks so far. I think mine will be a little bit different in the sense that I'm going to be talking Mostly, I guess, about like my title there is Crisis, Catalyst, and Creativity around this subject. And uh, obviously, we don't have too much time to, uh, to express a lot of thoughts in detail, but I'll try to hit on, for me, one of the most important projects that I've been working on and uh, will be working on also because there are a lot of projects upcoming that I'm involved in, but in a way that kind of uh, explains uh, the problems we have in today's world, um, because if we actually look back and we try to see what actually the word crisis means, um, it's not exactly what the situation in the world is at the moment. Crisis is defined as a, a time of intense difficulty or danger. So in that respect, I think any designer uh, pretty much faces this, this challenge every day of his working life. Um, we don't just need a crisis to uh, respond to a certain situation. Our whole sort of thinking and process of thinking is geared towards solving everyday crisis or challenge or problem. So in reality, it doesn't take uh, the current situation to make us think out of the box, as they say. It basically is the mode that we're constantly in to deliver better solutions to the world uh, for any type of situation, any type of difficulty, any type of uh, design challenge we face. So uh, again, the crisis is something that we deal with as designers on a daily basis. It doesn't just happen and stimulate us. Um, if I can just briefly go into uh, who I am, so you have a general idea of, of me as a, as a person. Um, Ian explained it fairly well and in depth, but if I go to the next slide, uh, it will show you a little bit what the bulk or the, um, the majority of my life work up to now has been. So I'm uh, a car designer and I was, uh, as mentioned, raised in Casablanca, Morocco, but that led me through different stages of my life to moving to California in 1982 to study car design, uh, which has always been a passion of mine, drawing automobiles, obviously and science. So I think design uh, in this day and age is not viewed so much as an artistic profession, but rather art combined with science. 
and any type of outlet in the creative field that allows us to do those two, two, two uh, blendings of, of directions uh, can be called design. Um, and uh, it's very soul satisfying when, when you get to work in this field and especially if you have you know, a few hits along the way, it just intensifies. So I started my career in 1986 and you can see the first car I did up on the top left is the Ford Escort Cosworth. And then it ranges through a whole spectrum of type of vehicles. Um, so that, that bandwidth is pretty extensive. There are other vehicles that aren't included in here, uh, but the ones that are most known, I think are the ones you're able to see here on the uh, screen. So yeah, I did move from uh, what we call a bread and butter design type company, which is Ford. That's not in a negative uh, connotation. It just means that it's a high volume producing manufacturer through BMW, where I was able to uh, create um, a design for a new market at that stage in the 90s, which was the SUV market, onto reinterpreting the iconic uh, Mini uh, from the late 50s and early 60s into the new one that came out in 2000. Then I was uh, called up, I guess you could call, say it to Ferrari and Maserati, did some cars there, moved over to the parent company Fiat and did the 500. Then from there over to England, where I was involved uh, with creating all the new McLarens uh, and their road car language, design language, and uh, releasing those to the market. After that, I got into the other uh, professions, which I'm gonna be talking mostly about now. Um, and that's moving to a complete, I wouldn't say complete different field, but it's obviously going from land to air. Um, if I show you what the crisis has always been in transportation, uh, with the next image, I think you'll see it immediately. Um, the whole problem with design is how to bring in safety, I think. We, we identify design as being the art of creating beauty, but more so than, than the obvious fact that the products we design have to be beautiful is safety. Now, in transportation, we face this problem pretty much every day in one way or another. Uh, I call it Jamzilla, what you're looking at here. This is just a normal everyday traffic jam in LA and uh, it's not unique. It happens all over the world uh, in major uh, cities, I would say. And uh, typically as you move outwards, traffic does tend to uh, ease up, I guess. So the problem here is not only uh, stress, I guess you could say, and delays caused by stress, or stress caused by delays, but also the fact that you're just overloading the capacity of the uh, transportation networks we have. This is not only happening in cars, it's also happening when we try to get to the airport and get on flights. Typically, it's a very busy uh, area. Uh, trains also, obviously, in the morning with the rush hour, getting, getting to work, getting back. You're causing a, a lot of um, intensity of, of movement through, through people getting from one place to the other. We haven't really solved the problem. We understand that the problem is, is, is volume in terms of moving people. It happens every day and it's something we have to accept as a challenge. But there are other ways that are very simple uh, to solve this problem. Obviously, and I love to speak about it, I won't get into it too intensely, but there's a, um, my inspiration for design has always come from a subject called biomimicry, which is the way that nature answers uh, challenges. I don't call them problems, I call them challenges because there's problem seems to have a negative connotation to it, but a challenge is always something that we can look positively at, at finding the solution. So using nature, how do we work around some of the things that nature has taught us along the way? Um, if you understand what I'm showing here, murmuration, it's how large clumps and large groups of, of organisms, animals, fish, all these have this almost like a sixth sense of being able to travel in high density in an extremely safe way. I mean, if you looked at murmuration, you would see if you could slow it down that a bird that is perhaps 200 meters away from another bird are in complete total synchronization in terms of movement. It's not a relayed signal. It's sort of at the same time. It's what we call real time uh, signal transmission. So. Um, this is something that we still don't understand in science, in bio biology, it's still a, a mystery how this actually works, um, but we see it constantly and it's incredibly effective. So what has been uh, being slowly introduced into the world of automotive transportation is autonomous smart uh, technology driving. So 
we expect at some point in the future, I don't think it's gonna happen in our lifetime. I don't wanna be negative about it, but I do think that on the road, um, what we call sort of level five uh, transportation is something that will be far off because it's very difficult to incorporate smart technology cars in the same traffic as not smart technology cars. And that means that it's not a safe environment to operate in. We would either have to have all smart technology or solely as a lane that's geared towards these type of vehicles with this capability. So until we get to that point, it's gonna be very difficult to travel in high volume uh, along the existing road networks uh, in any way that can kind of um, allows us to be safe and uh, effective and efficient. So. Uh, my next step after designing cars has been into a field which will allow us to perhaps exploit another dimension in terms of getting from A to B in a much more efficient way. Um, has nothing to do with airplanes, has nothing to do with trains, and has nothing to do with uh, the existing road networks. Um, what it is, is something that we call EV toll aircraft. You're not looking at a plane, you're not looking at a flying car, you're not looking at a helicopter. What this is, is an electrical vertical takeoff and landing device or apparatus. Um, you gain so much advantage <laughs> through this type of transport. Um, if I can briefly mention the advantages, obviously um, uh, the one thing is that you're able to fly from point to point. These are not long distance uh, vehicles or, or uh, transport vehicles. They, they operate over a maximum, say about an hour's travel at a speed of 180 or around 300 kilometers an hour so that your daily radius of living and of uh, working and living um, can be within that circle of about 180 or 300 kilometers. So you could potentially live outside the city uh, in an area that is more rural, cost less, and travel into the city on one of these uh, at a rate, at a cost rate that is about half what it would cost in, a, say, an Uber taxi. Um, basically, because you're filling them up with around five to ten people, um, they're very efficient. There's no real uh, uh, infrastructure needed to pave the way. You ha you're using the existing sky. They're not fl flown personally, obviously, because that would create havoc. Um, there won't be that many of them up at the air in the air, but they'll be piloted by trained pilots who are representing the company or the, the brand of the uh, company who makes these EV tool aircraft. Um, obviously the price is uh, important and also the timing advantage you get is important. You can also fit luggage. There's a certain uh, capacity of, of what we call payload. Um, but the objective here is to transport people quickly, comfortably and safely from point A to point B within an hour's distance approximately. Um, at low altitude, so we're not talking about pressurized cockpits or anything like that. It's just going to be a, an environment and an experience that is uh, very unique and obviously very new, comparable to the, to the jump that we made from uh, when we were on horses to cars, which was uh, very uh, exciting for a lot of people, at the same time very intimidating because we suddenly picked up quite a bit of velocity and uh, speed. Um, but this will actually become something normal in the future. So our current generation of grown-ups might be a bit hesitant, but the young generation will probably be more accepting and, and, and find it as the new norm. Um, the problem here, obviously, is safety. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be landing in cities on uh, hotel uh, rooftops, for example, specialized city landing ports, as you can see here but it will change the environment. And I would say it would change it in an important way in terms of uh, um, offering this, this new type of mobility. The challenges are obviously gonna be the safety challenge because we can't imagine one of these having a failure you know, at, uh, at a few hundred meters above uh, ground level in a city area. So the actual safety um, level has to be what we call 10 to the minus ninth. Um, to give you an average, 10 to the minus 6 is what we use in the aviation industry, which uh, is currently the safest way to travel. 10 to the minus 6 uh, safety factor in aviation means that very rarely will you have something catastrophic happen. But 10 to the minus 9th is what we are all uh, on our way to achieving, and that means that you can rarely have a, 
an incident because there are so many backup systems that will come into into play when we when something could potentially happen and also the degraded vision environment where we're traveling around in fog and things like that but obviously the advances in in navigation and radar technology will allow us to to, to get around uh, these certain uh, challenges that we will have. So the other challenge, obviously, in the future that we all have to respect and be aware of and be responsible of as designers. And again, it's not a crisis. It's just the way the world is moving. We've constantly, in the new, new age, called this one of the most important things, is sustainability. The circular economy of design means that basically whatever we design is not going to waste. It's being reusable in some way or other. That is one of the critical factors that a designer has to take into fact and into account today when they're when they're designing. The newest project, along with EV tool aircraft, that I'm working on is something surprisingly um, revealing when you understand that the infant car seat market, so baby car seats in cars, has not moved on uh, in the U.S. since 1970. In other words, any baby seat on the market in 1970 is still legal and certified for use in today's 2020 um, age, uh, millennium. <laughs> um, in Europe, we've moved on since, two, we haven't moved on since 2000. So that means at the shortest level, 20, uh, 2000, we have not introduced any new safety technology into infant car seats. Uh, a lot of problems with the car seats, but nobody's applied any type of new technology into this market. So. Um, as you can see, I'm not going to read what's on the screen, but you can see that there are quite a bit of, uh, quite a few problems or challenges, I guess you could say, in terms of today's baby seats. Most of all, like I said, the safety has not been improved uh, since uh, 1970 in the US and 2000 in Europe. So uh, the timeline of the child car seat, obviously we went from basically just something that supports the child to eventually through the decades coming to something that you can see on the far right is what is expected to be uh, on the market and that's what you basically choose when you have a child. Um, the market now is, I wouldn't say clamoring, but they have not discovered or looked for any new technology uh, to improve today's market. So I have been approached by uh, a very innovative uh, company which provides uh, energy absorption systems for armored vehicles. Uh, those are vehicles that get into critical situations where a lot of energy has to be um, absorbed in, in a crisis moment. Let's call it that way. If you have a, uh, a vehicle that receives a, a hard shock or a hard explosion, you need to protect the people inside. Um, that obviously has many benefits in, in armed services and things like that. But the idea now is to take that technology and move it into the civilian or commercial world in a way that it will best benefit today's society. And what more of a benefit than the number of children that we have that are in accidents on the road, although they're in a child seat, the, the uh, safety levels are nowhere near what they could actually be with new technology. So I've worked with a company called Baby Arc, and we are introducing later this year and into the world market the following year, uh, a baby seat that represents uh, four values. First of all, it will be the best uh, seat in the market. Second of all, it will introduce new technology and, and quite a bit of innovation. Third of all, it will be sustainable in every respect. And fourth of all, we're using biomimicry, the science of nature and design to influence the design of the seat. So it will be absolutely unique in the market. And uh, I won't go too much into the technology unless you ask me later. But what it is able to do is be approximately almost 70% safer than any other baby car seat on the market today. Uh, that's a fact, not just a belief. It's been proven. And I think this will cause a, a revolution in, in design uh, for, for this segment. So uh, without getting into too much uh, detail, it basically takes, like I said, biomimicry and the science of supercar uh, technology into fact so that we create a super light, super strong and super efficient baby car seat. The way we do it, obviously, is we look through nature for uh, animals that do absorb a lot of impact. Uh, obviously, the woodpecker is one of the most extreme ones, and we're using principles of this incorporated into the design of the seat to be able to absorb the energy. Uh, we have also considerations for not only front and back impact, but also the side impact, uh, such that the, um, 
The impact from the site is also considered in terms of uh, energy absorption for the head area. And when we look at how we achieved lightness, which is very important in these seats because oftentimes they're removed by grandparents or transported by mothers and uh, people who aren't as strong as, as grown men. Um, there's a lot of new technology in terms of the carbon frame and structure, which uh, is borrowed obviously from supercar technology where you only see it at the very high end, but we're bringing it down into a volume market. Um, the seat looks approximately like this. This is uh, a pre-prototype version, so expect it to look a little bit glossier, and a little bit more impressive, but we're showing the technology in a way that it doesn't look offensive. We're offering gender neutral colors, and basically it's a new shape for a car seat that won't look like any other car seat on the market today. It will have its own uh, technology and uh, uh, look, identification, and, and like I said, the inspiration is from nature. Uh, it goes around the design of an eggshell, uh, a lot of detail. <laughs> um, again, the materials are recyclable, and we can reuse the seat often. That's a very important principle in today's market. Um, the next one, basically, creatively designed products to ensure safety is the new normal. Like I said at the beginning, that is at the top of the pyramid in terms of importance for the design of any new project that we're working on. We know that uh, COVID-19 has brought new challenges to us today until we actually get the vaccine that will put us a bit more at ease. Uh, we're having to look now in terms of mass transport, how to protect the people on, on these systems of, of uh, transport. So at least you will feel more comfortable. Obviously we'll have to be protected in terms of our masks and things and whatever other devices we can uh, uh, take care of, say ourselves. But as a service, we have to provide more safety. Um, obviously in, in mass transport, like I said, it's important that the seating offers you this, this type of intention to, to be uh, separated and, and not close to, or too close to, to other people on board. So there's a lot of thought going on in terms of how to arrange seating, front, back, uh, staggered approaches like you see here. And then also um, in terms of be being singular and not, uh, uh, a I mean, you can choose. The option is, uh, the best thing is to always be able to choose an option if you want to communicate or not with your uh, co-passenger, I guess you could say. But it, we'll also move into the world of how we can keep our cars safe in the, in the sense of uh, protecting them um, in terms of what we didn't used to think of so often when you come from the outside into your vehicle, are you bringing any of the virus uh, capabilities of the virus to affect us on the inside of the car? There are already a lot of uh, movements in design to how to disinfect the car. Uh, I don't want to say disinfect because it sounds negative, but at the same time to protect yourself. So a lot of the research is going into the first uh, high volume products that do receive a lot of unknown people into the vehicle. For example, uh, Ford working with the police on heating your car or heating the vehicle while you're out of it at, to a temperature of about 133 degrees to eliminate the viruses that are potentially in the vehicle itself. Um, quick slide to show you how it can work. And then obviously uh, we don't want to be walking around like this. In the future, we need some type of protection that looks more acceptable. So I can see that, um, as I said, in, in, in ways to protect yourself in an acceptable manner, we will be moving this type of design responsibility into the world of fashion. You can see here, we can still do sunglasses that look very nice and also cover our faces in a way that doesn't really uh, affect the aesthetics of any product that we have to design in the future. When we're working in a more um, environment, sort of like an office, obviously there's a lot of potential in furniture design to make that isolation sort of uh, environment uh, aesthetically acceptable. Um, I don't want to see the world go in this direction because I, I don't like isolation as, as it sounds. I like integration, but we will have to address uh, this type of, uh, of new world with new design solutions that are uh, acceptable. So if I can just uh, move to questions and answers. I'm sorry I spoke very briefly and uh, superficially about a lot of these things, but uh, my problem was I could speak for hours and uh, I have to stop at 20 minutes. So I think I've just about hit the target on, on 20 minutes. Um, Frank, that was uh, fantastic. Um, really good. I particularly like the uh, 
staggered seating design. I'm a very anti-social flyer and I'll be waiting for that to come in for some time. Um, so we have some questions. I'll just run through them quickly. Um, so you said the uh, eVTOLs are piloted. Um, does that mean that they're not planned to be autonomous uh, or is there a, a nuanced uh, combination of human and technology piloting at play here? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, they, they will be piloted at the first and more than piloted, I would refer to them being as controllers because there won't be a lot to do on these airplanes. The big thing with being piloted is the safety factor. Most of the errors that happen in the air are due to pilot error. Uh, and if we can eliminate the need for a pilot, theoretically the plane will be safer. It'll be uncomfortable obviously for, like I mentioned, us as a generation used to uh, actual people driving the vehicle or piloting the vehicle. But if we can uh, digitize it in a way that we eliminate the pilot, um, it means that there's only a, a, a plus or a minus, so to speak in terms of controlling the airplane. And you can sort of program it before you fly that will only go in this direction at this altitude at this time and down a predetermined corridor, uh, flight corridor. So that will eliminate a lot of potential risk uh, 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 of error. Um, and so yes, they will initially become uh, controlled by what we call pilots or can call pilots. But I think after a certain amount of time, we'll be moving towards autonomous flight which um, is, is actually very able and, and uh, capable of, of happening, of doing, but there is an initial phase that we have to go through where there is somebody on board for, uh, for the security of the passengers to make sure that everybody's fine and understanding. But the transition will happen, I believe, very quickly, much more quickly than in the automotive field. Excellent. So um, I have to take this question because uh, it's from my dad, who's in New Jersey at the moment. Uh, okay. He says, uh, looking towards future design challenges, uh, what would be your key advice to aspiring new design engineers? Uh, to, to become a designer is almost like saying you want to become an actor or a professional sports player. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, it's almost now, I mean, and before it was a great job, now it's become sort of a dream profession to be able to be a, an engineer or a designer. It's one of those uh, very nice professions to be in if you, if you can open the door and get in. And then obviously, like I said at the beginning, have a few hits along the way. It just makes your life feel like, you're, like it's worth living. Um, but I think the challenge is to be unique. Um, obviously getting the education is, is typically the easy part of it because once you get your in education, the doors start to open up. The problem is obviously that companies don't require a lot of designers or engineers. They require great designers and great engineers. The more larger these departments become, the more diluted the, uh, the results become, become, I think. I think it's important to keep design and engin engineering teams small and high quality rather than volume so the main thing is be unique uh, such that your designs or your engineering solutions stand out so that you can get recognized for them don't think like everybody else you're paid to be crazy and uh, sort of a wild thinker don't fit in uh, challenge always challenge what what the norm is because that's what designers and engineers do they don't repeat they come up with a better solution or more practical or more efficient solutions. So always challenge the status quo. And if you keep knocking on the door hard enough, so eventually somebody's gonna open it. So keep, if you're in that process of looking to get into the industry, bang on as many doors as you can and don't stop knocking until they tell you to go away. And uh, probably got time for one more here, which is um, how do you deal with uh, distributed and open design? Do you see that as a challenge or opportunity? Uh, open design in the sense of bringing in different uh, design inputs from cross industry is that yes yeah I think it's the the most innovative and best way we can advance uh, design uh, so often we get the just the the typical solutions that are expected but if we use co cross industry uh, influences in other words people from other professions coming in and giving their let's call it two cents worth um, that can only be a good thing. Um, it's the best way to break out of the norm and to come in with ideas that 
may seem radical and impossible, but I, I, as a designer, don't like to use the word impossible or even the engineers to use the word impossible because in reality, nothing is impossible. It's just how bad do you want it and how much mental energy and passion do you want to throw at the project. So um, cross-industry innovation is one of the, the new, new terms, I think, that we can bring into design that can only better, better, better the, uh, the outcome, the final outcome. I think that's a fantastic uh, note on which to end. Um, it's my, um, it was a real honor to, to listen to you, a real pleasure. Um, thank you so much for uh, all your fantastic insights. Keep designing things that people love and um, be looking forward to uh, seeing the next uh, chapter of your uh, amazing story. So thank you, very thank much. you so much. And um, yes, we will see you again soon, I hope. Great, thank you very much, Ian. Thanks, Frank, bye-bye. Thank you.